So I'm going to talk about a database encryption. Uh, this is the work that uh, we were researching during my postdoc at uh, Harvard and Boston University, uh, as well work that we're doing right now uh, at our startup uh, Calypso, which is incubated at Tandem Lunch. So when it comes to sensitive data, there is a fundamental problem that no one trusts no one. So most companies, they want to utilize the shared resources of the cloud in order to analyze their sensitive data, but nobody trusts the cloud, nobody trusts uh, that it would not be hacked. And uh, this makes sense uh, regarding the latest breaches like Equifax or the scandal with Facebook. So nobody trusts to have their data in plain text in third parties. So what can we do is uh, is we, we can encrypt this data, but there comes what we call the security dilemma. Because the more secure you make your data, the more encryption you use, the less functionality you have and, the, and less usability on top of this encrypted data. And uh, how would you define usability and security? What we say as usability is that when somebody encrypts their data and puts them, let's say, to a cloud or to a storage server, they want uh, to, uh, there to be no changes in the applications that they are using. So any business wants to continue function as before without changing anything. The second one is that they want to, to uh, the new uh, cryptographic solution they are using to allow for all the queries that they were running before, not to break any functionality. And lastly, and more importantly, the execution speed of uh, their queries, they want to be exactly the same as before in order to continue doing business as usual, because uh, lower speeds means user frustration. Now, in terms of security, uh, in general, when we are talking about cryptographic solutions, we define it as, as their ability to uh, uh, deal with specific attacks that we know today or attacks that might be in the future. And here are four basic ones, which we're going to discuss in a little bit more detail uh, later. And the first one is memory breaches, which is when someone hacks the memory of the server where the data are stored. The second one are frequency attacks, uh, which apply to deterministic encryption, we'll see that later. Quantum attacks, that uh, Douglas talked uh, this morning. And uh, also side channel attacks, which is a newest type of attacks that we observed that exist in the last two years. So memory breaches. Most of the current solutions of uh, encrypting your data to the cloud, they offer encryption at rest. What this means is that if someone uh, removes the hard drive of the storage server, your data are secure. But what happens when you are uh, using your data, when you have a database system on top or you want to retrieve this encrypted data, is that the server, the database server, will decrypt the, the disk level data and put them in memory in plain text. So your keys and your data are in plain text in the storage memory. And there are tools that everybody can find uh, that an administrator or a hacker can use in order to view this uh, memory and view your data and keys, like the uh, uh, RAM scrapers and kernel debuggers. For the frequency attacks, imagine this, that uh, uh, let's say in the ancient Rome time, uh, Caesar wanted to send a letter and they had to encrypt it. What they were using is that they were encrypt each letter to, to map it to another letter of the alphabet. Now, this technique used to be really good, but today we know how to break it very easily because we know the frequency that each letter of uh, the English alphabet appears. So uh, this is what we say that applies to deterministic encryption. Deterministic encryption, what it does is that it encrypts the same text to the same ciphertext value. And by using a simple frequency attack, by checking the frequencies of its uh, encrypted word, we can break it very easily. Now, quantum attacks, we know that if we use asymmetric encryption, that it will probably be broken when we have quantum computers. So for a cryptographic solution to say that it's going to be safe to implement today, 
Ideally, we would like to use only symmetric encryption, like AES, with large keys to 56 uh, bits and more. Now, finally, is the side channel attacks that we want any solution to protect from, which uh, the most famous uh, vulnerabilities we know today is uh, uh, Meltdown and Spectre, that applies to almost all CPU chips that we are using today. Now, what they can do is that by not decrypting, not having access to the secure memory or to the encrypted data, they just observe uh, around it how uh, an application access this data uh, or uh, how much time it takes to do a specific computation in this memory location in order to reconstruct the original uh, information without having to decrypt it. Uh, there is an example uh, of a video that shows how Spectre works in a uh, in the real world. So there is a picture in a very secure uh, memory position. And what Spectre does, it just checks uh, the timing to retrieve specific memory locations. And they can reconstruct a whole picture by not having access to this, the, me the memory location that this picture was. Now let's see the cryptographic methods that we have today and how they do in terms of usability and security uh, according to uh, the definitions that we saw before. The most interesting bit is that uh, we've seen that uh, today's companies, either big ones or niche players, that they either can offer high usability with very low security solutions or high security with almost no usability at all. So bear with me, I'm gonna start with a to, to see them one by one. So the first one is transparent data encryption or table space encryption, <coughs> which is used by Microsoft and Oracle. The idea is the following. So we have the application, which is at the client side and the client RAM, and at the database server, we have, uh, let's say, Oracle database, has the DBMS engine, the storage engine, and the uh, physical storage of the data. Now, the idea is that uh, our database is going to be encrypted at the DBMS level, at the database server, and the data are going to be stored in the physical storage encrypted. The problem is that each time someone uh, wants to access this data, the DBMS will decrypt them. So at the server RAM, memory, the data and the encryption keys are gonna be in plain text while we are using them. The, uh, the, the positive of this solution is that it's very fast. We can support all database functions because the data get decrypted before we search through them. We can have indexes on the plain text data. We can use all the database uh, optimizations that we know today. The problem is, uh, as we saw print that uh, as we saw earlier that uh, this allows for memory bridges so this solution is not secure at all um, that's why both Microsoft and Oracle wanted to offer uh, another option for very sensitive data which is called for Oracle TD column encryption and for Microsoft always encrypted so the idea is that the encryption will not happen at, at the DBMS engine, at the uh, database server, but it will happen at the application server. So we're gonna encrypt its raw, or the, the, the data from our database, and then we're gonna put them in the database, in the cloud, or in the storage server. This way, our data and keys in plain text are only uh, viewable at the client wrap and nowhere else. But there is a problem there, is that this solution does not allow for any database optimizations because encrypted data, ciphertext, they do not have ordering, you cannot index them, the database cannot do anything because it, it, it cannot understand what these data are about. Uh, and that's why when we want to query, what happens is that uh, we have to retrieve the whole column, the encrypted column, give it back to the user, decrypt it, search through that, and then go back and retrieve the rest of the information. And this renders the solution very, very slow. And here is when uh, the new players come in because uh, this idea seemed really nice in order to avoid um, memory breaches. So 
the question is, can we do something in order to have functionality on top of the encrypted data? And this is the property preserving encryption. The idea is that the, the ciphertext we're gonna create when we encrypt plain text data will have some properties of the plain text, like the order. So if we order the ciphertext, the order is gonna be the same as the order of when we were ordering the plain text. Another example is here, we have the two names, John and Joe, uh, plain text, and the ciphertext can look like that. If you see, because both names start with J and O, the ciphertext, uh, the, the uh, numbers that represent these two letters are exactly the same. So now a database can run a wild uh, uh, card searches, can order the data, so we can have some functionality. But the problem is that in order to be able to do that, we need to use deterministic encryption. Each time we encrypt uh, uh, John, it's gonna be exactly the same ciphertext. And this allows for the uh, frequency attacks that we saw before. And uh, this is where we said, okay, uh, we know that there is the whole grave of encryption, which is called fully homomorphic encryption. So we keep the same uh, architecture, and the encryption gonna use is gonna be fully homomorphic, which means that you can actually do functions on top of the encrypted data. So you can encrypt two numbers, and if you uh, add the encryption of these two numbers, what you get is the encryption of their sum, which is magic, and this allows for very safe computations because it's on the encrypted data. You don't have to decrypt your data at all. But the problem is that this only applies when you do aggregates. And if you want to retrieve specific records, then there would be some uh, side channel attacks. And also, it's very, very slow. So currently, the current research that we have, the latest, uh, it gives some hours in order to do a simple search for a, a, a database which is kilobytes. And the biggest problem is scalability because uh, the time increases exponentially as the data increase in order to do a simple search. Uh, also, another thing for full homomorphic encryption is that the, we are not sure if we can make it quantum proof uh, because right now it uses uh, asymmetric uh, concept from asymmetric encryption in specific stages. <laughs> And uh, so it might be vulnerable to quantum attacks as well. Uh, because of all these problems, and we didn't seem to, to go no, uh, anywhere uh, with the, the solutions we had, uh, searchable symmetric encryption thought of something else. The idea was that, okay, let's move the, the, the DBMS engine to the application side and have the encrypted data to the server side. This would allow us to build indices on top of the encrypted data. As an example, let's say that we have uh, a database with four rows for uh, clients and uh, for, uh, for employees of the company, and these are the ciphertext. So this ciphertext might have a, a picture, their name, uh, surname, salaries, and everything. And we want to index the salary field and the name field. What we do is that we, before we encrypt the data, uh, we can build our indices as a database would do in the DBMS engine level, and then we're gonna encrypt its raw and put it in the database server. Now, if someone wants to ask for the records that have a salary 33,000, we just need to follow uh, the pointer. We, we just get the ID of this encrypted record. We retrieve from the database server and return it back. We decrypt it and we are good. The problem is, is that this solution, although it's really fast because we can have all the database functionality, uh, is that it suffers from side channel attacks. So let's see an example in order to see how a site channel attack could work here because it's very simple. Uh, let's say someone observes in the database server, this is the cloud, let's say Amazon, and Amazon can see what's happening to the encrypted data in the disk. What it will see is that you ask a question about salary 33,000 and you retrieve the fourth encrypted record. No one can decrypt this record because they don't have the key. But now they know that the last record in this uh, database has salary of 33,000. And now somebody asks about uh, records that have named George. And we observe that the same record is gonna be returned. 
So now Amazon can infer, oh, I know that George has a salary of 33,000. And if someone observes more and more, they will be able to uh, infer all the information of the database without even decrypting it by just observing the queries and what you return and what you detach. Uh, so in order to solve this, uh, access pattern attacks, as we call them. The next solution was Oblivious RAM. Oblivious RAM is a technology that allows you to hide all the access patterns. How it does that is that each time you touch specific records in the database, it re-encrypts them and shuffles them. So no one can tell if you retrieve the same record again for a different query or not. Oblivious RAM, it's in this uh, uh, architecture, will work perfectly, uh, although its speed is not that fast because it has to do the re-encryptions and shuffle some data. And it solves almost all problems except the volume and timing attacks. So the volume attacks on a database is how much information you are retrieving after asking a query. So if you ask a query about uh, employees that have salaries above uh, 500,000 uh, uh, dollars and you do not retrieve anything, someone can infer that in your data set, your employees in your company, no one makes that amount of money. Then if you ask a very specific question, someone has salary 423,000 and you return one record, they can infer, oh, probably this is the CEO and this is the salary of the CEO for this company. Yes. Can you sure, but the problem is how much padding you should do. This will highly depend on the database you have and the answers of the queries. Because the padding, if it's deterministic, it will always reveal something. Now, random padding, this could work, and uh, we will see that uh, later, okay? So the question is, now that we saw all these uh, solutions, uh, can we have a solution that offers the maximum level of security, deals with all these attacks, and also be fast enough and support all possible queries to have usability that is practical for everybody? And the answer is yes, and uh, this is what uh, we're going to see. Uh, so the, the idea is to continue from the ORAM solution. So we know that ORAM uh, hides all type of attacks except volume attacks, and uh, also it's a bit slow, so we need to increase its speed. So if we manage to eliminate the volume attacks and also increase the oblivious RAM speed, then we could end up with a solution that would be practical and also really secure. And how can we achieve this? The answer is by using uh, tools from the privacy domain. So to put on top of the oblivious RAM differential privacy. So the whole idea, uh, what we call DP ORAM, differential private oblivious RAM, is that at the lowest level, we're going to encrypt each record in the database using AES-256, only quantum proof symmetric encryption. Then. Above of that, we're going to build the oblivious RAM in order to make sure that we eliminate all the access pattern attacks. And uh, what is left is the volume attacks. And for that, we're going to use differential privacy, which essentially what differential privacy does, it says that each time you're going to retrieve uh, an amount of records to answer a query, you're going to retrieve some extra records, which are fake calls. This way, you will hide the amount of information you are retrieving. Now, another interesting part by using differential privacy is that it allows us to make Oblivious RAM faster because Oblivious RAM has uh, stricter guarantees, which is uh, to be completely indistinguishable the way we retrieve the records, where differential privacy allows uh, a, a, the indistinguishability not to be that strict. Um, so if you have more questions on that, we can, and you can ask me later, and I can tell you exactly how depression privacy makes uh, ORAM faster. And actually, by using DPO ORAM, this is uh, the solution that uh, we are using at Calypso. 
and this is the product that we are offering. And uh, we saw that, uh, uh, that the security, uh, we hide all, all the attacks that, that we saw before, and also that uh, compared to solutions like um, uh, Oracle's uh, column and encryption, we are 10 times faster. So our solution is both secure and practical. So thank you very much. Uh, if you want to talk more about it, you can find me after the session to, to discuss one-to-one. Uh, -one. And also, uh, we are looking for collaborations and also to hire researchers, either full-time or interns. So please let me know if, if you are interested.